To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. Sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So today on the podcast, I had on Tyler Johnerson. So I've been um, wanting to get Tyler on this podcast for a long time, man. The guy, the guy is consistently successful with all weapons, with his bow, rifle. Uh, he also do does uh, filming and photography, which incredibly talented at that. And um, he also runs dogs. He has this passion for running dogs off uh, and running them for bobcats and mountain lions. Uh, just real introspective and, and real forthcoming with information. And so he ran down to the house here to the new studio and we sat down and recorded it. Uh, it went a bit long, which I think is a treat for everybody. Tyler has also got a film coming out. Uh, that's going to be produced by uh, the guys at Blood Origin over there, all about the houndsman and, and the journey and the, the dogs and the love for it. Man, it's going to be an absolutely awesome film. I can't wait for it. So be on the lookout for that as well. We'll give Tyler some support on that film. Uh, it's going to be an amazing piece. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, really appreciate his time, and I know you guys are going to enjoy it too. So we'll get right into it. I just want to thank a couple sponsors. I want to thank Zamberlin Boots. I've been using Zamberlin Boots and Shoes for the last handful of years, and uh, these guys just absolutely knock it out of the park. Uh, they do such a quality job with their craftsmanship, quality controls, quality materials. They're trying to build the best boots and shoes out there, and, and I believe they've done it. They have a bunch that I like, and you guys know that I... I like like the, the, the shoe or the low cut because I love the light weight as I feel like a pound on my foot is like 10 on my back. They have a bunch of different models now, and I like all of them. I like the Anabasis. Uh, I like the um, Free Blast. Those are great shoes, and I would use those all season. I think my best or my favorite has to be their 215 Sloth GTX RR. This is an incredible burly shoe with a Vibram sole, so you get a ton of grip on rocks, uh, waterproof, and, and their waterproof capabilities last for years, not months on these shoes, just due to their craftsmanship. And they take each Gore-Tex booty and test each booty that goes in every single one of their shoes uh, to make sure that it's absolutely waterproof. And it shows when you're wearing these things. Uh, so a burlier shoe you can get more life out of. They stock really well, hunt gnarly terrain. So I really like the the 215 Salute GTX RR. Um, they're actually coming out with a low-cut booth in this same Salute style this year. So you can check that out. It's still going to be lightweight, just offer a little bit more ankle support. Uh, the other boot that I really like is the 320 Trail Light Evo GTX. Uh, that's a low-cut, lightweight boot as well that comes in at under 3 pounds, waterproof, a great boot. So they have different boots and shoes for everybody's preferences too. Is uh, Some guys like a, a little bit heavier built, more ankle support. They have that. Uh, absolutely everything you need. If you're in the market for new boots and shoes, make sure to go check them out over at Zamberlin. I also want to thank Sig Sauer Optics. I'm so impressed by Sig Sauer Optics. They have their image stabilizing binos, with, which I think are absolutely revolutionary. Like, to have a stable image, I just pick out more game animals. Uh, so they have those in a, a 10 by 30. They also have them in a, a 16 by 45. Just uh, great optics. And I, they're actually revamping and redoing this line that will come out this year. They're putting their high-end glass in it, uh, redoing them. They have a target mode where you can actually lock it stable on the image. They're just absolutely amazing. Uh, I love them for picking up animals. And they have uh, everything you need for optics. Uh, killer rifle scopes. They have uh, their spotting scope is so crisp and so clean. 80 mil objective lens, 27 by 55 power. Amazing. Their standard binoculars have such great glass in them for such a good price point. So they have their 10 by 42s. Uh, I have also a pair of their 15 by 
um, what are they, 15 by 50s or 15 by 56s. Just a, a great addition to my optics. And they uh, pick up a lot of stocks for me. I love them. And then I think the best rangefinders in the market. So their new rangefinders have a bow speed mode. So you can actually set it to the speed of your bow to get the exact cut on an angle, both uphill or downhill. Uh, so amazing optics, amazing rangefinders. If you're in the market for anything uh, optical performance, make sure to go check them out at Sig Sauer Optics. I also want to thank Black Ovis. Black Ovis is an internet retail shop. They have all the top name brands, all the gear that you need for your next hunt, a real knowledgeable staff that you can call that will help answer your questions. Uh, along with all the top name brands, they have their own brand, uh, which produces quality items as well. And I mean everything from sleeping bags, sleeping pads, to to food, to clothing, to to archery equipment, you name it, they have it. Um, you can also save 10% by putting in the promo code ELEVATED10 and get 10% off your order. Uh, they also have a, a point system that you get on purchases and one point equals one dollar that you can use on future purchases. So you can really save a pile of money by using these guys. Make sure to check them out over at Black Ovis. I also want to thank Camo Fire. Camo Fire is an app that you get on your phone and they do discounted gear. So 80 new deals that come up every 24 hours. You can save a pile of money if you watch this and look out for the gear items that you're looking for. Um, they have overstocked items or extra items in there and uh, just a great way to get a good deal on quality gear. So check them out at Camo Fire. Over at Eastman's, just ran over to the office over there, had a great meeting on things. Uh, make sure to check out everything we're doing beyond the grids that are coming out. Uh, have some new episodes that are coming out from last season's hunts I'm really excited about. And um, make sure to check out our Mule Deer School. I'm, um, I'm so proud of this product that we put out. It's a Mule Deer course. Uh, it's got a great price point on it. Uh, I think it furthers your learning curve by years, and it's absolutely everything I know about hunting mule deer. It's everything I know to be able to travel, find units, stock mule deer. We have a rifle section in there done by Guy Eastman, which is so knowledgeable about hunting mule deer and rifles and calibers and such. Dan Bacar is also on there, a heck of a mule deer hunter in his own right. And um, I'm just really proud of what we put out. So it's a video format, and you walk through these chapters. It takes most guys a week or two to walk through over 100 different videos. We're adding to it all the time. So I was just over at the office looking at what we can add to this course. Uh, you can also save some money there. You can save 10%. Put in the promo code BRIANMDC and save 10% on your order there. Uh, yeah, I'm really proud of how this came out, and I think it'll cut anybody's learning curve by years. Whether you're a beginner or an expert, you're going to pick up great tips that you can implement into your own game plan. Uh, so check it out. Uh, also check out Eastman's Tag Hub. I've got a promo code there. Just put in Brian. And uh, with your order of Tag Hub, which is our internet research tool, you'll also get a free subscription to Mountain Tough Fitness. Uh, so you can put in that promo code and save a little bit of money there. So um, check that out. Check out uh, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal. Um, let's see, I've got a, I just finished an article. And I've got another couple projects coming up. So I've got a bear hunting article. So I did some um, spring bear tactics, uh, did a little bit for social media, and then um, uh, writing a full article right now for the next Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal all about bow hunting spring black bears. So really proud of that. Check that out. And um, the next one is going to be in the Eastman's. I can't remember. I think it's Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, but we have both magazines there. I write for both of them. Uh, credible articles. Our staff pour, pour our heart and souls into those articles, so make sure to check those out as well. And with that, um, yeah, just getting back from the Eastman's office. Great meetings over there. Got some work done. Really excited about the future there and some things to share with you guys. But um, for now, let's get into this podcast, man. It's an awesome one. Uh, so pumped to have Tyler Jonathan on the podcast. Uh, amazing wealth of knowledge. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Here we go.
All right. Well, yeah, man, that's, um, that's so interesting. We do learn so much as hunters just through failure. And I think it's, um, you can't shortcut that no matter how much you learn or how much you pick up, uh, tidbits you read about until you go apply it in the field and you go fail and it hurts and cuts you so deep. Like Mm -hmm. you miss a big buck or whatever, like when it cuts you that deep, it's something that hits home with you that then the next time you get in that scenario, you, you tend to remember it and try to act different. Oh yeah. And it's like separating the wheat from the chaff. Like all the guys want the success first and Mm -hmm. it's like do you think these guys that are that successful just go out and get it done and 99.9 percent no you know but with the law or the way of hunting it's like we all have 50 percent skill and 50 percent luck i don't care that's how i approach hunting because we've all seen the first time novice go out and shoot a 220 inch buck and it's like how is that even possible and it's like because you got to be out there Mm -hmm. but all those years and failure it's like that's the 50 percent skill package that when you become very good at what you species you target or whatever you've just heightened your chances a lot because skill has a lot to do with it or being a student you know Mm -hmm. like that failure gives you that chance to i'm not going to do it that way this time and you still need the luck though that mm-hmm. part still needs to land. That's interesting. So 50% luck. Like I I tend to come from a different school where I definitely believe that there's luck involved, but I believe wholeheartedly in having my hunting skill set to be able to capitalize on it. Like there's a hundred right decisions you have to make. And I think there's always like a way to solve that problem or a way to get in on that animal, you know, if I can do it correctly. And I agree with you on the luck, but you also create it. Like you like you said, you being out there all the time, being a student of the game, having this good skill set, eventually you just run into that big buck and then you have your skills to a place to where you capitalize on that opportunity and you get an arrow in them where in my younger years I would have totally messed it up or whatever. But I I think we're basically coming from the same place. It's just when I say half of it is luck, it's like you may know where that big deer is because you've scouted him all year. But the bad luck side of it is, is you might go in there and a lion killed it. And now you're starting over and you better have some luck on your side. Or, you know, you're in a scenario where you've done everything right. Your skills have put you in a position of absolute success. And for whatever reason, the the elk just vacated the zone because that year the spring dried up in there. Mm-hmm. Everything just didn't work out the way, you know, like I've just had a lot of things happen to me where there's bad luck and there's good luck and, mm-hmm. and, we all need a little bit of it to go our way, but then when we're, when we have a skill set that we've built, you know, to a highly efficient point, it's like, yeah, we're going to have a lot more chances to put an arrow in the air than most, but that he still has to clear into that shooting lane. He might, how many animals have you had stop one step? <laughs> I mean, that's Hundreds. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, totally. The odds, it's like, how do they know like that? Like almost a sixth sense, right? It is a sixth sense. And I, this is going to go back to the skill set side of things is when you've, when you've failed so much and you've been in that situation so much, I believe you can temper your aura, your body as a bow hunter and that animal is not vibing that sixth sense at a level that when you're a novice, they are. Mm-hmm. And I think there's an unknown barrier there that's going on that, you know, I've just witnessed it a lot. I mean, that's why people hire guides is to put that hunter in that position and tell them when to draw and what, you know, because that's the failure that we've all had to go through, you know. I I can't tell you how many times I've failed. Mm-hmm. It's insane. And those are the stories we don't talk enough about really Mm -hmm. because it's humility and Mm -hmm. humbling and you know you just we all want to talk about the big buck and the big bull we got and but that didn't come without massive failure Mm -mm. you know at least for me I, i like that uh 
that's a really interesting thought experiment like the uh thinking about your aura out there and and the the older i get like i've always had this this go for it all in attitude which creates a lot of opportunities for me but a lot of times i'm pushing so hard that i end up blowing that animal out and so i've developed these patience over the years mm-hmm. and patience kills the buck like the more patient i can hunt the more patient i can wait totally. uh the the more opportunities come my way and my aura getting back to what you're talking about is like i started to get really comfortable in bow range and i started to realize like for so long i pushed so hard to get into bow range because it's like if i can just get into range of a big bull i'll kill him but then i start realizing after that experience comes in that that's only half the battle like Mm -hmm. like the other half is getting a clear window getting a clear shot keeping the element a surprise and so i started to find this calm about me in bow range where i was really patient and i knew you know, elk are so big, they take such a precise shot. Even though they have a big vitals, you have to put that arrow right on the mark and it's got to mm-hmm. be at the right angle to kill that bull. And so I would just wait and be patient, wouldn't give myself away, keep that element a surprise. And I, you know, had the motto that patience kills the buck. And then also another one is let the buck make the last move. So totally. if he's bedded down below me, I'm not going to expose myself to his head to try to get a shot in his bed. Instead, I'm going to get into range, not let him know I'm there or I'm hunting him. Let him stand up and then walk out and then look around for danger. And they always look around right when they get out of their bed. But wait till he's not looking at me or he goes Mm -hmm. to feed and I've got the right angle and then bend my limbs and put the pin where it needs to be. Like that's that next level stuff. Well, I think some people consider that like that's flow state. Or that's, oh, yeah, that's yeah. when you get into the, like the zone yeah. or, and that comes from doing it over and over and over and failing and knowing when, you, as soon as you start thinking in those final moments as a bow hunter, you're likely going to fail. If you can't just allow it to develop, like you are saying, and a big part of it too, is guys don't know when to speed up and throttle down, you know, like. There's times where you got to be ultra aggressive, but then you've got to be able to throttle that thing down and then sit and be patient. And it's hard to like go from, you know, 110 to zero and then get ready to go back to 110 and do that all in this just being in the zone, you know, and I just think that comes with lots of failure in bow hunting and mm-hmm. lots of experience and, mm-hmm. you know, watching other people do it. You know, I've. I was filming, I filmed hunters for ever. I mean, I haven't been doing as much lately, but you, I still You do some. so much, man. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, by the way. Thanks for yeah. coming over and jumping well, on I with me. I appreciate you having yep. me. Yep. But um, it's more of like, I think the hunting journey for me, I'm an artist, so I love filming and photography and, you know, bow hunting is an art. Any hunting is an art. I mean, I'm a gun. I'm, I hunt, you know. Um, so I like to take the artistic approach to hunting, and I think – you know, some of these best, let's just talk about just artists in general, they aren't trying as much as they're just letting it happen. And then they're in it. They're, they're observing and reacting and throttling up and down. And that, when it comes together clean and perfect, that is art. That's to me. And like, I'm, you know, speaking of that, where I'm involved in this big houndsman film that's going to come out this summer and I speak to that, you know, about hound dogs and and the art of, you know, handling a pack and finding the track and, you know, I've trained all these dogs of all different ages and I've got the certain attributes of this one dog and this other dog and, you know, how they work together as a well-oiled machine and I'm the handler, you know, I'm the leader and they make me look good, you know, because I've tr- put so much time into them and the culmination of the cat in the tree and it's not the shooting of the lion in this case. It's the art of the process. And that to me is hunting. Like I love it. I love that part of hunting and we keep, you're a big bow hunter and I love bow hunting and all hunting's the same to me, but bow hunting just takes such an intimacy that if you don't, if you don't put yourself in those positions over and over and fail as an individual, I don't know how you can't, grow and become better without that failure you just can't i mean you can read every magazine you can listen to every podcast you can watch every youtube video unless you're doing it and applying it and trying to find that your personal flow state you know in the moment um 
you're only going to be as good as you've limited yourself, you know, and that's, I think ultimately all of us as like passionate, true lifetime hunters, we're always growing and learning, but it's coming through that process of letting it all go and letting your experience take over in those moments. And, you know, again, that's like when it finally goes down and you're like, Holy crap, you're just freaking out. It's like, that was like art. That was, you know, I mean, the, sometimes the stocks are days, mm-hmm. not, not the day, at least for me. I mean, mm-hmm. and that comes from time and time again of failure. And you're like, well, it's probably best right now if I just observe, take it all in for about the next six hours, see what he does right at dark and might try to apply that tomorrow and maybe the next day. And, you know, whereas like you were just saying, it's easy to become impatient mm-hmm. when you get confident with your bow and you're a good shot. It's easy to get impatient and just try to go make it happen. And I mean, I agree with some aspects of making it happen because you, you do, but a lot of it is letting it happen. Mm-hmm. You got to make it in there and then let it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was a hurdle for me for a lot of years. Cause like you said, you get right into that final moment and there's probably there's a hundred decisions you got to make and they got to be right. And they're all happening. Just, and, uh, you know, to let that develop and happen is, it's hard to contain, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a journey. It's fun. Man, is, that's, um, I've never heard it explained or articulated as, as art, but it like, it hits home with me when you talk about it and when you say it, um, mm-hmm. it it's so on the money and, and, like I say, um, you know, just even listening to you, like I've um, uh, been introduced to you and we've interacted a little bit, but even the 10, 20 minute conversation about the dog since you've been over here, since we've hit reef court, like I, I picked up on things and I've learned things and I, I, I see and hear your passion for it. And, and and being a student of the game, continually learning, I've heard you say that a couple times now, and that's what I live by as well, is mm-hmm. constantly learning and improving. Mm-hmm. And that, that flow state that you're talking about is like developing your instincts. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, hunting different species in different habitats, being in different scenarios, and putting yourself in that place so many times, and then... Being in the, that present moment, not be thinking about your phone or your social media or your email or whatever it is, is really taking that in. And then, you know, it's like those decisions you make, those hundred right decisions that you have to make in that in that bow range. You're right is that you don't really think and weigh your options. And it's not black and white. It's not like if you choose this, you fail. If you choose this, you win every time. You know, like that isn't that isn't what it is. It's all gray. And you have to make these decisions mm-hmm. as you go. And you have to rely upon your instincts and trust your instincts. And, you know, not that, um, uh, uh, you know, I... I, there's definitely better bow hunters out there, but I know I've paid my dues and earned my skill set to a point to where I'm going to give myself a good chance and I can trust myself to make these decisions in mm-hmm. the moment. And and the other thing you talked about that, that I wanted to explore a little bit is your speed. Like speed in the mountains is so imperative. Like you can't still hunt through the mountains the whole way. You're exhausted. Like we have to do that mm-hmm. in Hawaii for smaller parcels for axis deer where we have to still hunt through thick and things like that. And I think you do want that, that still hunting skill set when you get in thick cover, but it's like knowing mm-hmm. when to move fast and when to move slow. And that's like, that's, that's elk hunting to me. It describes mm-hmm. it perfectly because you're traveling with the herd and you've got to keep up with them and see where they go. And they have like these tendencies that you learn, like they start feeding around before they bed. And that's like a good chance to, to arrow a bull. But as you're trailing them, there's times where you're running to keep up with oh. them. And then every time you come up over a crest, every time you get close, you have to, to move to a snail's pace. So you're yep. going from a run to dang near a crawl and you'll do that more multiple times just inside a morning hunt and if you get it wrong the whole thing's blown up and busted and you don't get a chance at that bull if you get it right you keep the element of surprise and even if it doesn't come together and the element of surprise is everything to you then you can back out and you got that bull again in the evening you know so uh, just like i just wanted to expand on a couple of things that you mentioned there because i think you're so right on the money yeah and i mean they're they're well as we're talking about elk hunting i mean to touch on that 
there's a lot of ways that you can have high success in elk hunting. And I think there's, you know, I've, I've got a particular one or two that I like to pursue and I've had, that's my angle of how I approach it. But then there's other guys that they've got their angle and their technique. And I guess what I'm getting at is, is a lot, all this boils down to is being able to allow your instinct to flow, to be what it is, what you've created. And so I like the element of surprise, just like you're saying, I like to be able to throttle up and throttle back and not blow it apart until it's time, you know, and before, you know, I, when I was more immature in the bow hunting game and hadn't killed very many big bulls and I wanted it so bad that I would get in that final moment and I would make a mistake because, because I started thinking about it, you know, and, and now I'm like, I look back on that and you know, the last few bulls I've arrowed, it's like, I don't know any other way to put it other than it literally came together so cleanly. Not not that the shot was wide open or anything like that. It's just I made all those right decisions in the last few moments out of instinct. And I'm at full draw and I, and I just, and it's over. And you're like, holy crap, did that happen fast, you know, and. That just take that takes a lot of time and not thinking. Mm -hmm. That's doing or just executing, and so it goes. You know, I don't shoot enough target practice as I should, and but also live in a little different head space. There, I'm big on developing the muscle memory, mm -hmm. but I'm more importantly um, a mental student. So as I near hunting season, I'll only shoot one arrow a day mm -hmm. because it's the only one that matters. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to go out cold, you know, first thing in the morning or sometimes it might be in the evening after I've, you know, spent sweating all day working or doing whatever I was doing. And when I can keep that confidence high in my mind, I can take that to the field in, and in my head I'm living in such a high positive space and I'm not thinking about, you know, I'm not saying it's not the right approach to make sure you have your technique dialed and mm -hmm. you're holding the bow correctly. And, you know, but that, that to me is secondary when you're getting in that final moment of hunting, you can't be thinking about that stuff. You got to think about this one chance, this one arrow and sending it and knowing that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's just no second guessing that it's not going to hit home. And you don't, always you know you, there's a little branch you don't see and deflect and that's part of this luck thing we were talking mm -hmm. about i mean you know you got your window and you just didn't see that tiny gray little branch in the low light and oh, that was bad luck mm -hmm. you know but yeah that's i don't know again you just can't never stop learning but there comes points where i've kind of can hold it in my hand and i'm like this is how i approach bow season mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. it's not right for maybe everybody but i still did mention i mean it's so important to be able to hold your bow for a period of time you know and not be shaking and freaking out and so there's certain muscular things that i do to try to prepare but when it comes down to like repetition and i know i'm probably going to get completely blown apart for that but i don't shoot the arrows that people probably think i should like in terms of the numbers, probably nothing like you or like Dan Picard or John Barklow. These guys shoot like crazy. And um, it's just been my approach. But I think so much hunting is in the head. You know, you can be mentally just completely blown apart, frazzed out. If you don't know how to control that, then your success is limited. It's mm -hmm. just the way it is, you know. So that's a part of me with bow hunting is... I've just kind of got this approach mm -hmm. and um, it's been working, but you know, I don't always get one, but at least I have a kind of a system. I get my system. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and me neither. I, you know, I don't know that I'll ever be perfect. There are so many, you know, so many limbs out there. There, the devil's in the details or a missed range, or mm -hmm. he takes a couple steps and as many good shots as I make, I'm yet to have a perfect season with eight animals that got eight perfect arrows. Like there's mm -hmm. something that goes wrong in that season yep. 
And like you say, it's such this this mental game, keeping your mind into it. And and you touched on a couple different things there, your approach to bow hunting and then also your approach to execution on animals. And um, uh, I, I think um, you're right as we all build these different styles of hunting that that isn't – you know, as, as many similarities as we have, like there's so many differences in the way we approach the mountain and the way we move through the mountain and go. And I have one buddy that's the most patient buddy I've ever hunted with. And he moves so slow in the mountains and he glasses every time he stops and he kills animals. And it drives me nuts because he moves slower than I move mm-hmm. in the mountains. Then I have another buddy that's really aggressive and he pushes to get these opportunities and pushes really hard and he kills a lot of animals, but it's faster than I like to go and faster than I like to hunt, you know, and so we all have to build these tendencies and I've leaned towards, you know, spot and stalking has been, you know, kind of the route where I've gone, but there's, there's more than one way to get it done in the Mm -hmm. mountains and you have to build your own style of bow hunting that fits you. And and part of that is developing those instincts and listening to Mm -hmm. them. And I, I think your execution on animals, like they're, is a difference between shooting at a target and shooting at an animal, obviously. Like, um, you can be this great target shot, and you can shoot thousands of arrows, and you can be so good on the range. And I've seen great archers buckle at when they get the chance. At a big buck or a big bull, they fold, and they can't execute on an animal. And so, you know, the, the deal is is to try to transition or transfer this skill set that you've earned with the bow on a target and good accuracy and be able to transition to that to your one shot on an animal when he's there. And I love your one shot groups. I do the same thing, only, you know, I'll do a few of them a day or I'll shoot my one arrow and I'll put so much weight on the first arrow that this is my arrow. This is the one that counts, you know, or get like, I love when I'm shaky and my aim isn't good. Like I work Mm -hmm. so hard to make my bow steady, but here I am in my gym doing pull-ups and push-ups and high heart rate. And I pull back and that thing is nowhere near the X kind of like being on an animal, you know, where it's floating and I got to continue to execute and the arrow ends up in the middle, you know? And so like these, these tools or these drills, they're as much a preparing ourselves physically as they are mentally. And in the mental side of it is where it's at. Like you won't, you don't kill hardly anything, or maybe you're a 50, 50 hunter until you can flip that switch in your mind until, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you're patient waiting for the right angles and the right shots. And then that execution is consistently on an animal. And, and you said it like walking around the woods with confidence, like confidence is King knowing you can make that shot, knowing Mm -hmm. you can make that hit and then executing it when the time comes. But that's like the real, fun about you said for me. so you said confidence is king and i i say confidence kills mm-hmm. and that's, i love and that. i that's live like better. that it's yep. like when you're not cocky confident mm-hmm. so you know what's the difference well cocky's you can go in loose and being a little too cocky and get your you know get yourself busted pretty easy because you didn't allow the confidence to work so let's just back this up my operating work or business is hunt solo ventures for a lot of reasons, but I do hunt by myself most all the time. And it's like, it's not that I don't like hunting with other people. Cause I really do. What I've found is even if we're in the same camp and we go opposite directions, I find that they creep into my mind because I'm thinking about their safety or not that I really am like worried about my buddies or but there's always an element when you bring another two-legged person into the wilderness and you're trying to hunt a big bull elk or big buck. I think when I can eliminate that and I'm completely just me, the critter I'm chasing and the elements, you know, the sun rising and setting, you can, you can get into to revisit the zone or this flow state moment of, and I don't want to sound cliche, but like being one with nature, you're literally more in tuned, engaged. I'm more stimulated. I'm, my instincts are more like living outwardly. Like I am just hunting. I am not thinking of anything but me and the quarry. And I mean, I think that's what makes true excellent hunters is to be able to have that comfort level but being completely isolated from anybody else and being able to do it day in and day out and to keep their head in the game. I mean, I have a good friend of mine who's a heck of a mule deer hunter 
um, John Rubish, you know, John or Jono, he, uh, he lives to hunt these mule deer and he has the ability to be able to hunt by himself and believe and just, and he puts a lot of time in, he really knows deer, but, and he, and he can, he can believe it and live in that sense that I just explained to where there it is. And then he can help and go make it happen. And when you have other people that are birdie in your ear about what they saw or what they didn't see or where their emotions are at or where that weighs on you as a hunter and it can be positive, Mm -hmm. but a lot of times it can be positive for the hunter that hasn't, he's got some ground to grab to achieve, you know, the higher level of his hunting skill. He needs that other guy. So you're only as strong as your weakest link. So I like when I do hunt, you know, and I've filmed hunting for 20 some years and I guide hunting and I'm, when I'm hunting with these other guys, they're some of the best in the business, you know, that, so I'm trying to glean anything I can from them to apply to my own hunting. But at the end of the day is as amazing as hunters, these guys are, and you're, you're good as a team. Trust me. I'm not taking anything away, especially in the sheep world. There's lots of glass that's going on. And, but like elk hunting, if I can just remove myself from any influence, I find that I have lots higher success. Um, you know, when I'm in a camp with somebody else, I have lower success. And I just, I'm hunting the same. My head's just, my head space is different. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I can't, it's hard to quantify exactly um, what I'm trying to explain. I can, I can feel it Mm -hmm. when I'm out doing it because I'm just completely immersed in my hunt. I'm Mm -hmm. not worried about anybody else's hunt. I'm not worried about, you know, where he's at. I'm not worried about what he saw. I'm not just not worried about it. I'm Mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. And, you know, whether that's how I interpreted, you know, the behavior of what I saw across the Canyon and what they're going to be doing in the morning and, what my best angle is going to be. I mean, as soon as you get another, let's call it the best hunter that you know is hunting with you, he's going to have an opinion. You're going to have an opinion. It's going to be a lot harder to hunt from the gut Mm -hmm. when you're talking to somebody you really respect that's Mm -hmm. an excellent hunter. And so this goes back to the whole art of hunting and, you know, what it's like. That's the art to me. It's like trying to, like, have that that hunting aura that's just one with your quarry, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, and bow hunting's one thing and gun hunting and hound hunting. And, you know, I used to trap a lot and it's, it's all the same, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, that's part of what I enjoy the most. I think about, um, the whole, the hunt solo pursuit, I guess, is mm-hmm. just what I'm learning about myself and the critter and having these real pure decision-making moments where I'm letting my instinct flow mm-hmm. and learning from what whatever my instinct did. And uh, you're always graduating because you're, you're there. as soon as you ever stop learning or you think you've got it mastered, then you should just quit. <laughs> and that's a fact, you know, because you'll never, you know, there's game that we've chased our whole lives and they'll do something that, you you just can't even you can't even mm-hmm. fathom. I've had that happen twice this year, lion hunting to me, and I've caught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lions. And I had two t- two things happen to me this year. I just can't explain. I mean, I, th- I kind of have some reasons, and I've called some people I really respect across the country that are big houndsmen, and I told them what happened, and they're just, you know, my friend Larry is the one that brought that up. He's like, well, Tyler. As soon as you think you know everything about lions, you know, you better just hang it up. You know? <laughs> He's like, the day you stop learning is the day you should quit. Mm-hmm. So, and that was quite the point. But, you know, big stinky lion to me, and I'm not going to undermine the difficulties, you know, at least in our north country. I think lions are fairly easy to catch um, for the most part. You know, let's knock on wood here. But... <laughs> Of all the years of doing it, I just have never seen what happened in these couple circumstances. And it's like, man, is that humbling, you know? Like, I thought this was going to be a slam dunk, you know? 
like we'd I'll, this one just happened this last weekend a friend of mine caught a nice big tom and a friend of ours he's been wanting to kill a big tom cat for i think 11 years now and i did how i'd treed some before maybe 10 years ago with this guy so we were like heck yes i didn't realize that like let's get jamie let's go back there and let's go run this thing from the tree and you know so we went back and there was some dry ground and a huge long striated cliff that ran about a half a mile but all the snow was all the way around this tree so it's like a no-brainer i mean we're gonna run this thing and catch it like they just can't get away I mean, we got excellent dogs. You know, I have some of my dogs, young dogs there, but and my other buddy had his pack, and they're phenomenal bobcat hunting dogs. So they're, I mean, bobcats are way harder to catch than lion. And we went in there, and do you think that we could find that cat? We couldn't find him, and our dogs could never scent it. And, I mean, people are big houndsmen across the country are, going to be sitting there saying we well, must not have very good dogs and i'm going to tell you right now that i'd put my dogs up against most guys that i know as far as catching cats at least in the north country and i'm not saying just snow you know i'm talking broken conditions icy windy warm dry ground whatever and uh i just can't put it together as to what happened there i just can't f figure it out and i'm like this was a great big old tom lion what did he do like what trick did he pull on us like how how could we not strike off of that you know even on dry ground it was only 13 hours later because he caught him at dark so i don't know i really and that's what keeps me coming back is like she i would have never dreamed in a million years that that would happen and it happened and that was the second thing that happened this year that i can't explain so i'm being humbled you know and i've been a houndsman for 20 some years and but that's the coolest part of nature is, is you just don't ever know mm -hmm. like you you know you you've applied all this time and effort to learn a species and uh you've got it dialed i mean your success is so off the charts and then all of a sudden there's a hunt where you come out of the woods and you're just beat down. You're like, I have no clue what happened there. That's, <laughs> and that's what's so cool yeah. about what the wild is, yeah. is uh, critters are amazing. I think they're way smarter than we give them credit for. I mean, anytime that people cheapen how dumb bull elk are, or, you know, a big mule deer or a big old lion, I'm like, you haven't hunted them very long then, mm -hmm. you know, because they're not dumb. No. They do say they can do dumb things, mm -hmm. but we all do dumb things, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of times that's what gets them killed too, but yeah, so they have a, a, a will to survive and their their instincts, their survival instincts get so keen over the years. And mm -hmm. and um you know, not from just avoiding us hunters and us hunting pressure, but avoiding cats out there, the most efficient killers on planet Earth. Like we talked a yep. little bit before I hit record, but you you had tracked a lion this year that stalked a, a bull elk and jumped on its back and killed it, a uh, perfectly healthy bull elk. So mm -hmm. those things are the ultimate predators. And yeah, we, um, you know, don't give them enough credit. And those big bucks... You know, they're no harder to kill, like a, like a, just score wise, you know, a big mature six year old deer is no tougher to kill, whether he's 200 inches or whether he's 160 inches, mm -hmm. just born with different genetics and different habitats. And that's the way they grew up. And so it's not impossible, but it's so difficult. And they do, they humble us. As, mm -hmm. as good as I pride myself at being at, at bow hunting and as hard as I work at it, I still, I'll be in a season and wish I would have heart worked harder, wish I knew more, wish I could be better on the stock or better with the chance. And the same thing, I mean, I got humbled this year. I hunted another state I'd never been in and I got in there and it's just epic hunting with um, big bucks and it's real uh, like uh, like Badland style, broken country, break styled country. And so uh, it's really tight. And I found myself, these deer were so switched on that you, you, like a master vantage point didn't always work. I'd use a master vantage point but a lot of times I just have to go hunt through it and you have to mm -hmm. see them before they see you. And so that's the game. And the distance that you see them is usually, you know, 200 yards to 500 yards is when they expose themselves in the country to see them. 
man, I had a couple bucks that would just catch me before I had a chance. And sometimes it was my mistake where, you know, I got lazy and I walked out on the ridge line mm-hmm. instead of being down off the ridge to get to the vantage point before I sat down and glass. And it's like, oh, that buck's got me picked out from 500 yards mm-hmm. away. But that, that place humbled me and the stocks were tough over there. And then you know, I finally got a chance at a buck and it, it all came together perfect. It was like day seven, day eight. And uh, we spotted this great big heavy buck. I had seen him in the early season in velvet. I was chasing his running buddy that he was with, but he's a, a great big three that's really heavy and bladed and chased him in velvet, older deer, you know, and, and um, I found him as a hard horn and he was like this great hard horn three and he was by himself and bedded him behind a lone tree. We had a long ways to get, we were already a long ways in there, but we had a long ways to get to him and we popped up to where he was and we're in long bow range from the bush where he's at with a good wind and sitting there and gosh you sit for a half hour and nothing nothing and 45 minutes and gosh is he still there or did he get up you know mm-hmm. mine starts playing tricks on me and so I decide I'm gonna back out and I'm gonna circle around where I can get a different angle and I might be able to come down the same ridge he's on and get a shot on him over there now the thermals are starting to change and pulling up a little bit better and I go up and around and I glass and there he is. He's better right behind the bush. I can see his antler sticking out. He's still there, still in the same spot. And um, I kind of check the wind. I think, no, we need to go back to the spot we were and we'll wait for him to stand and he'll walk out and then we'll get our shot at him there. And so um, I just, we, we kind of tuck back over the ridge. We pull off our jackets and we go to make our move around. I said, oh, let me take one more look and see if he's there. And now he's up on his feet. You know, it's just the timing of things, mm-hmm. the luck you talk about. Mm-hmm. And so we scramble back down to that other position and then I get to that other position. I, I'm glassing where he's at or where he was and every little exposure from the ridge line, I'm glassing it, making sure that I'm not going to come over the top too quick and I'm not going to bust him. Don't see him, don't see him, don't see him. And pretty soon he's right down below me and he's coming at 40 yards and he's coming broadside at me. And I'm uh, I'm able to, he's at a dead walk and he's going to walk into the cover. So I have a range on him, I draw back and then I grunt at him and he stops. And I settle my pin and execute and the shot breaks. And right as that shot break, that buck spun and got completely out of the way of that arrow. Oh uh, like we've got the footage of it, like the, the move of that buck totally moved around. I mean, it almost got him on his butt on the opposite side, the way he whirled. And then he did the bound and just goes and just disappears over into the prairie away from me and Amazing. just breaks my heart. Yeah. And it's oh. like seven, eight days of effort for a heartbreaker like that. Yep. And it was a tag I did didn't end up filling it was my best hunt of the year but I think sometimes these failures too they drive us to mm-hmm. get better these questions we have with ourselves or these humbling hunts you know as I think back like I love to celebrate my successes like the the Shiris moose that was 30 days this year to try to find I didn't see a moose for the first seven days like it took my mental fortitude of being able to keep putting effort forth day in, day out to try to kill a mature bull with my bow, that's like a highlight for me for sure. But when I think back of this season, I think back of that deer tag and oh. that miss and that those some of those opportunities I had and just think, I got to be better next year. You know, it's like nothing I could do in that moment or that point where that buck jumped my string. But, you know, what if I could have added a couple more days Mm -hmm. or could have made another trip out there or made better on some of these bucks that I spooked working through that prairie, like be better at picking them up, keeping the element of surprise. So there was a bunch of places I could improve, but I just had a riot on that. Well, that's, that's too, though. That's comes with the maturity of being a a great hunter is is the mental gymnastics of that much effort come culminating on failure and if you can't pick yourself up from that and get your head clear and your head space ready to like engage again you know that's the graduation of the, the the excellent hunters in my book is it's not it's not always these success stories and pictures and stuff we see and hear and talk about it's the story you just told because that that's what makes again i always i just reference myself because i've hunted i was a student of the hunt for my entire life and i've got so many failure stories that are awesome stories but it's just humbling to you don't want to tell all your stories of failure but that's what that's what chilled me into being a good hunter mm-hmm. you know and then and then on top of that you know being a you know, following mountain lions around for the last 20, 20 plus years. I never w- chased lions or hunted lions until I was in my early to mid twenties. Um, 
But that was because I was being true to myself. I wasn't out to kill a cat because my buddy did. Or I, I was compelled to hunt the creatures I love to hunt. You know, and even bears. I didn't start bear hunting until I was 17. So, you know, and I, again, I grew up born and raised Montana. I mean, I hunted since I'd been seven years old with my dad and uncles. And back then we had real snow, you know, where snow's over my waist as a seven, eight year old. And they'd just say, follow my tracks and do not get off my tracks. And they just leave me, you know. And so it's, you know, it started at a young age, but, you know, to jump ahead to like the predator hunting, that didn't come to me because I saw my friend do it or somebody at school or my friend's dad or that came to me out of the purity of like wanting to pursue that and then so now with the mountain lion thing of 20 plus years of trailing them I realized like this is the best solo hunter arguably on the planet and certainly in North America so if I want to learn something from nature about how to kill stuff with a bow I need to be a student of this lion and so then you know that goes from getting a dog and then you get another dog and then you know at that time when you're in your infancy of being a houndsman you're just ecstatic to see all these lions and take pictures of cats and talk about the cat you catch and then as you get older and more and more into it you realize like what the dogs are doing and the interaction as like a pack leader and and inner and handling dogs and just just how wild and crazy it is that these creatures are trailing and they trail differently and then but what they can do now especially with technology is show me every step that this lion's taking and what it's doing and why it's doing it and what 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 it kills and you know when i tree it i can look at it i can see the scars or i can i can age it de decently through the stride lengths or you know you can, and all that stuff is a data set again of the best solo hunter in north america and it's like i'm trying to be the best solo hunter i can be so i gotta learn from again i want to learn from the best you know and so that's a big part of like i think my whole full circle houndsman lion hunting world and you know i anymore i prefer to run the bobcats as much as possible because they're such a difficult quarry but i never give up a good chance to run a lion because of the learning curve of it um i'm still fascinated by them when i look at them in a tree i mean there there's something about them that just you know they reek killer you know they're just fascinating creatures to me and they're looking at you in this real docile you know tone like well what are what are going on there what what are these little dogs doing to you? and you're just looking at them and you're like you're like absolutely insane killer and you're just so, I don't know. There's something about that to me that goes back to when we first started talking about when you get in that intimate final moment as a bow hunter about your aura of being calm and letting it just happen. And I could tell you a quick story about a mountain lion I chased one time to show you what patience is. I had been in this canyon the day before and it snowed you know, pretty hard throughout the night and, you know, it quit, I don't know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And we used to hunt awful early, you know, so I'd be out, I say we, I've changed my hunting timing approach as I've gotten older. But back then, you know, I was probably four in the morning or something and I'd cut this track because I was in the canyon the day before. Well, it was all snowed in. So obviously this cat had moved before midnight. So we wait for daylight. I know it's fresh. We run it, run it around the ridge or whatever, and we tree. So we walk the trail, and back then we would always walk the cat track because this is before GPS, and we really wanted to see what our dogs were actually doing and, you know, what puppies did what. And, and I followed this track, and this cat had gone down, and we had it treed, I don't know, 25 yards away from where it was sitting, so it was a snowed in track all the way to a tree and he was watching all these deer come up the hill right at daylight. So he'd been sitting from at least 12, 1 a.m. until 7 a.m. without moving a muscle. And that just proved to me like the cat knew it was going to kill a deer. I mean, a thousand percent was going to do it. 
and he was just waiting. He didn't make anything happen. He just knew these deer were going to come to him, and he was just waiting. And I just thought that should tell you a lot because as bad as we wanted as hunters, as, as bow hunters, um, it, human nature is we want to force that, you know, because we can reason. And we reason ourselves right into failure. <laughs> you know, we, we do things that, you know, your your gut instinct as a good hunter is is usually right. Um, but your mind can get in the way of that. And I just, that was a big learning thing for me. And I was, you know, I was in, I'd only been cat hunting at that time for just a handful of years. So, but that stuck with me for this long. And I just remember thinking, man, the patience, you know, of that cat. Like, and I'm not talking like walking around a tree or right to the base of a tree and not move for six hours. Cause he, these deer were feeding down in this brush patch and he may or may not have been able to slink down and kill one. But I think he knew that they were going to come up out of that and bed on the little bench he was on. And they were, I mean, you could see that they were coming that way. And then you see all the deer had run off and the cat was in the tree right next to where it had been sitting. And I don't know. It just stuck with me. And I remember thinking, yeah, we, we, we think we're good hunters with a bow. Like when we have some success, can you imagine being a mountain lion and making a living, you know, killing with teeth and claw and, you know, and we were talking earlier before we started recording, but people don't understand, like, if a mountain lion gets injured, it's dead. If it breaks its leg, I mean, if it breaks its jaw, if it gets an infection, they're dead because they have to be 100% on their game to be an effective killer and to get the nutritional value of that. And, and uh, it's just a real precarious line that they live, so... I think, again, if you can really pay attention to a lion and some of the nuances of what makes them such a lethal killer, those are details that I like picking up as a bow hunter and trying to apply them or at least try to incorporate that into my approach because they're just, they're a proven, you know, they're a proven killer. I mean an effective one at that you know you don't see very many just dead cats laying around they just and i i believe a lot of that has to do with you know when they get hurt and injured they basically go on a nutritional nosedive and they go crawl in a cave or something and they die so we just don't find them but overall i mean how many have i caught over the years and Man, I can I can remember a couple with like a reset jaw where their jaw actually was broke and then it rehealed. But missing toes, I've caught some with some missing toes. I've never caught one that I knew had a broken leg that healed. I mean, they're usually just healthy, you know. And the chaos that they have to live in, oh. like attacking a deer, an elk, the kicking and trying to hold mm -hmm. something by its jugular. And like you say, they have to risk everything. everything. Every time they go for a kill, they have to risk everything. Mm -hmm. And they have to be 100%. Not yep. that they have to be 100% kill, but 100% not getting injured sure. or not hurting themselves. Man. And I have caught a handful um, and some big toms with missing eyeballs. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, is that in a fight? or It's likely like a horn, mm -hmm. a horn tip or something. But you know what? They're fat and healthy with one eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just... They're rough and tough, you know, and they're still making a living with one eye. You know, you and I, we don't want to go bow hunting with one eye closed, you know. So, you know, I just look at it as it's just a fascinating thing to be able to learn from something that's so effective at killing. And I think the percentages, frankly, are way higher than what we think. When they choose to go kill, mm -hmm. they kill at like an extremely high rate, like 70%. Wow. Wow. Yeah, seven out of ten. So stocks. I got lucky this year. I watched a failed stock from a mountain. Did line. you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I was hunting um, deer in late season, and it it was almost like he, like it was an opportunity that popped up as he was mm -hmm. rolling through country. Like he didn't know they were there. He okay. was slinking through the sagebrush, and all of a sudden, I watched him see the deer on the ridge top, and mm -hmm. I watched him crouch down, and then I watched the patience. Like you can learn so much by oh, watching yeah. a cat, and I've never heard it explained that way. I've never really. 
I haven't caught the bug of chasing cats. In fact, I've never been yet. And well, I've, we're going to have to go there. I've started to find interest in but listening to you talk about it is amazing. Like what you learn from them is the ultimate predator. But what I have learned from is, is watching cat stalk. Mm-hmm. And you can watch a kitten that's brand new that doesn't know anything. And a kitten is a way better hunter than I am with, mm-hmm. you know, dedicating 25 years of my life to it. Like just their instincts and knowing when to move and when not to move and watch them just be. Or in- how to move. Yes. I mean. To how to move, how to be still, and then just their patience level mm-hmm. that they can have a Tweety bird right in front of them, right in pouncing range. And they'll just wait and they'll just wait until it's looking mm-hmm. away from them. And then they pounce. Like they, they have these instincts that are born into them that are far beyond something that we can ever develop, oh, yeah. but we can learn from it. And watching that mountain lion this year, I was watching him, watched him see the deer and watched him crouch down and watch the patience of him just sitting there mm-hmm. watching these deer. And then he's like maybe 15, 20 yards away from him by the time he crested to where he could see him to where the deer are so he's really close to him but he didn't try to make any move he just held there just straight held there for 10 minutes and didn't move and i could just see him crouch just watching his quarry and as the deer moved over the the rise and they moved over the other side that's when he made his move to the top and all of a sudden you can see him moving and it's so fluid and so low and so much intention to what he's doing like he has a plan he knows what he's gonna do and he came up over the top and the deer caught him coming up over the top and they spooked and so i got to watch a field Mm -hmm. stock but i think you're right as that they are highly efficient and to bring that to more of a clarity is when a cat is young, so for the most part, they'll be with their mother till almost two years old. Toms might leave a little sooner, but they're learning, but they have the instinct built into them. But they're learning through their mother some of the techniques of what she's honed, but a lot of that has to do with um, where to hunt and behavior. See, it's, this goes back to there is failure with all hunters, but see, the mother is very effective. She's failed enough when she was young. That's why they stick with their mother for that long, because a lot of times the mom's killing, and then they'll come in and eat. They'll do, you know, they'll maim stuff and let them take it down and, you know, just like that. But once they get to be efficient killers, they're an offensive wired creature, so when they when they pick their quarry like they're hungry they're going hunting okay this is this is how they think cuz i've trailed them enough i can tell when they're hunting or i can tell when they're just really? cruising from yeah. the tracks from the just how they're traveling wow and when they're hunting they're offensively wired at a level where they know that they are not going to fail and I think this goes back to being good bow hunters and how your mental approach has to be. You have to have something to lean back into and rely on. And that, that comes with your failures and, and building blocks of experience. And then with us using bows and confidence and the mental side. But when, when we go out there and we apply, you know, okay, it's go time. When you let doubt leak in to your mind, that's how you fail. And that's a human attribute. I mean, all of us, it's hard to always be this confident because it's such a fine line of being cocky and confident. You know, I find that a lion is so confident that it, it just knows it's going to be eating red meat tonight. Like, and I, I just, I've just watched it happen in the snow. I've, I've watched it happen where they kill in the wide open where you're, the quarry would never dream that a cat's going to jump out of that sagebrush in the middle of a wide open and kill it. I mean, that's the confidence level of a cat that is pretty fascinating to me because, you know, and if you think about it and render this down, they, they can't survive if they aren't thinking that way. They can't, they just won't. And so that's another big learning thing. It's, and that's kind of outside the orbit of just tracking them and, physically observing it that's like going home at night and thinking about like trying to get in their heads you know and what is this cat thinking and again i think it's because in their minds they're so offensively wired that's why little tiny dogs i hunt 45 pound dogs you know i've kind of got this i've been breeding a handful of litters now and kind of have the 
the blood and the attributes I like to hunt, but they're just these little 45 pound sweet little, and I hunt all females. These do or these cats could kill them in a millisecond, like, but they don't because they're not, they're not wired to be chased. They just don't. So they flee and they go up a tree and they look at it like, what is that? You know, like, whereas you'd think all they got to do is, and it's true. And it, it has happened, especially up north. My cousin's from Canada, and he's told me some stories of some big tom lions that are dog killers. But a lot of that has to do with wolves and the following them, taking their kills and stuff. But overall, you know, you're just like, that's another fascination of how these little dogs can. And I've caught many on the ground and in 30-foot caves and grottos and cedar bushes and ledge them out. And, I mean, you could look on social media all over and there's guys with big old lions on cliffs and and quite frankly a good smart dog will not get touched and that cat will just sit there and hold its ground and that's another kind of a very fascinating mystery to me you know just that interaction is so cool and i think it goes back to that's just the way God intended it. it was canine versus feline and it's just in their DNA, just how it works, you know, and it's just cool to, to witness, but going all the way back again to the, the lion, it's like, they're so offensively wired and so confident they aren't failing. Like they just, that's how mm -hmm. they approach their hunt. And then when they fail, they don't beat themselves up over it. They just, they just keep hunting and then they kill the next one, you mm -hmm. know? So they are effective killers, but to their credit, you know, and I wouldn't call it defense, but just so people understand, it's like a lion for the most part, with the exception of maybe a really big tom who's just kind of on the move, they'll clean up that kill down to nothing. I mean, they'll eat the brains, they'll crush the skull. The only thing that'll be left is the mandible on the low jaw and some hooves and then the paunch. Mm -hmm. They'll eat everything else, all the ribs right down to the vertebrae. You know, so they're real efficient when they kill. I mean, they're getting everything they can out of it. And the very first thing they do is they go into the heart and the lung through the chest here and crush a couple ribs. And then they, they'll lick that blood and lap it right up. And they'll eat that heart and lung because that's the highest nutrient. So they're very smart wow. about how they utilize um, their intake because they don't have any fat on them. They're just a, the long walker. They're constantly moving and it's all about territory and eating and killing and moving and territory and it's just wild i mean if you and i had to go out there and never come home and just always be killing and eating and moving i mean what a life i mean we'd think it'd be fun until we fail and we're starving and we start mentally screwing ourselves and you're almost dead because you're starving to death mm -hmm. you know like i'm just i don't know again i just love lion and what they represent in the wild because you just never see them but i get to see them a lot and travel and track them and yeah that's probably my number one teacher i think that's so cool yeah man to be able to like you say follow their tracks and watch them hunt and watch them switch gears from traveling mm -hmm. country to hunting and then how efficient they are and see how many times they do get their core in how many times they do get their deer and that and like how they stocked up on it and how they made it happen mm -hmm. like that that one about that bull elk you were telling me that he used the cover of the tree as the bull mm -hmm. elk was bedded to move in closer through an opening yeah so yeah. visually they know that the, oh, yeah. that ungulates see movement you know they just mm -hmm. that's in their instincts they know that so they're able to use that you know the mm -hmm. the same things that we're using you know you said it like that we um outthink ourselves a lot of times or we get in our own heads it's it's funny, and I don't know why our brains are wired this way. Maybe it's just this fast-paced life, and maybe if we were more dialed in, like, uh, uh, you know, definitely, you know, guys like me and you dial in when we're in there. We're in the present moment, and it does take a couple days mm -hmm. to get in tune with I the agree. mountains. I agree. Like, my decision-making isn't great the first couple days, I and where thousands. I'm walking and how I'm walking. It takes me a little bit, a little while to adapt to the habitat that I'm hunting, feel comfortable it's in it. It's the tempo of yeah. nature. So yeah. if you can't sink into that, it's harder to, it's almost like you're this foreign object You are, and it takes some yeah. time to immerse. That's, I've always said it too. It's like, 
I look back on all the bull elk I've arrowed and the vast majority of them I kill on the third day. And it's like, well, why is that? It's what we just explained. You come out of this paced world that we're used to. And again, I'm where I'm lucky is my job is outside. Like I am always in nature and I'm usually by myself. So I have a unique perspective to look at this, you know, and feel it. But when I go and put myself out there by myself, it doesn't come together right away. Even if I'm on the game, it's almost, it takes time. And then I start getting into that f tempo and that flow. And like, and then this goes back to the art of it, you know, it's like, that's, that's hard to find for somebody that hasn't felt it. But if you keep doing it, you're going to find it and feel it, you know, and I mean, we're talking in kind of real foreign, loose terms here, but it's, it's more of like, it's back to your gut instincts and, and, um, allowing things to develop and letting nature run its course. And you're now a part of that process and, mm -hmm. and, um, you gotta find that, mm -hmm. you know, you can't read about it. Somebody can't tell you how to do it. I mean, you can, but to go apply that, that's a personal thing. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, and that's, that's, uh, it's learned, but it's not consciously learned. I don't think mm -hmm. it's felt. Mm -hmm. And there, there know. is thinking and strategy that mm -hmm. goes into hunting for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's like this mix of that and instincts. And I just find it funny how our own brains work against us a lot where we can be in a situation and my brain will tell me to hurry up and get over that ledge to see if that buck's there. Or like the example I told you, hurry up and get to that vantage point and sit down and then see the deer instead of glassing as I'm going or hiding mm -hmm. over the ridgeline. Like our, our brains, like we have to listen to them and be strategic with their hunting, but our instincts should almost be the higher voice. Or like it's anytime I'm getting close to a mule deer and I don't see him there, my my brain's trying to tell me, oh, he's already gone. He already left the country. He got out of here when I was hiking up, or he escaped mm -hmm. out this way. And in, in, in through time, I've learned to believe and hunt like he is always there. Absolutely. Like I yeah. just don't. I, I don't want to be the one that screws it up. So even if he's not there, I'm going to hunt so slowly and mm -hmm. quietly to this edge. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to pick it apart. I'm not going to be the one to screw it up because I've screwed it up so oh, many yeah. times, you know. But it's funny how our brains almost play this trick on us because it doesn't want us to be patient. It wants us to hurry up and get it sure. over with. Uh, hurry up and see if he's there. This buck's already gone. You know, he's not... But a lot of times, the majority of times, they're right where you yeah. left them, and it's your mind playing tricks on and you. And to expound on that, it's it's the positive thinking brings positive results. Yeah. And that, this is going to go back to the mountain lion and the confidence, the, the excellent bow hunter and the confidence. They're not thinking out the decision that they should or shouldn't make. It's the confidence of thinking positive, believing, believing he's going to do that. They may not, mm -hmm. but when it happens and your head's there, your head space is there, it's over, you know? And that, that comes from not chasing the tail that, that comes from exerting, you know, like all your focus and all your positive energy on a moment. So it can happen. Because as soon as you start letting doubt in, that's when failure knocks you over, you mm -hmm. know. And it's good. Failure is good. I mean, mm -hmm. bow hunters, bow hunting is a huge game of failure. That's what bow hunting is, you know. So I think as you get more and more years under your belt of, you know, really pushing hard to be a better bow hunter, you know, yeah, your success is going to go up exponentially. But that never is going to be 100%. You're mm -hmm. still going to yeah. fail over and over and stocks and that buck moved in just that short period of time and that's never happened at this time of the day and you know those are just things that's the luck factor again mm -hmm. you know you gotta have that luck on your side and, and um yeah i don't know again hunting in general to me is just fascinating and it's there's art and there's there's unknown and the sixth sense part of hunting and back to like whether you have a hunting partner with you on the mountain and you don't and your approach to that hunt and just how everything gets interpreted is just so because 
you know, one other f fun s or saying I always throw out there is, you know, well, what would the Indians do? And I and it sounds kind of funny, but Indians didn't wear watches. Indians moved with the seasons. They moved with the game. They did what was effective and efficient. And all of that happened without thinking. They just did it. And that's what we as hunters are trying to do. Mm -hmm. But we have so much distraction in our regular lives of, you know, it's just hard to step out of that, you know. And that's why people, I think, are so hungry for hearing and reading of the successful hunters is they think that there's some magic, you know, tidbit of information. And, and there are, you know, you can certainly learn very important things that are going to make you a better hunter but ultimately at the end of the day it's immersing yourself and listening to your gut failing but knowing like you know every step that you take in the wild is that's a that's a new place you're putting yourself and if your head is getting in the way you're you're not growing you know and it's hard to do that as a human and back to like the indian comment it's like they didn't pay attention to any of that. They didn't have any of that distraction. Their whole lives were encompassed by that. That's just how they lived, you know. That's like how we that. should try to live as bow hunters, you know, and just not be affected, you mm -hmm. know. I like to be able to go into a hunt, and I'm lucky, again, with timing of things, but or with, you know, how my work works and my wife. And I don't – I'll tell Marcy, I'll be like, well – I might be back in a day or two, just depends. But if I if I'm on them, I I'll just in reach you. I'm, I I don't know when I'm gonna be back because I want I don't want that stipulation on because mm -hmm. that'll make me hunt different if I know I need to be back by a certain time. And not everybody has that luxury. Or if you draw a tag that's only seven days or whatever, you gotta kind of understand what you're willing to settle for. And you know if you're trophy hunting a particular unit or something, you know, and that's a whole another conversation of having the clarity of, you know, what is, what is going to be satisfactory for you and knowing it's go time. And whereas in Montana, we're lucky because our seasons are just so long. And, you know, this year, what I found with, I bow hunted the first week with my wife and took the horses and it was hot and we had a blast. I saw elk and we were on some elk. They just weren't talking and we had a great time. I didn't have high expectations because I really wanted Marcy to arrow a elk. But then I ended up going back home and kind of waited for, air quotes, prime time. It was the worst hunting because everybody was there. And the elk were like, uh-uh, nothing natural was happening. So I'm out there, and instead of forcing it, I just – and I didn't get mad at the situation because it's public land and everybody's got a right to be there, and that's awesome because we have that opportunity but for me i was like i needed my head to not go to a negative space so i i just ejected and that's all that gas and you know tacking up the horses and getting camps in there and you know i'm nine miles back and there's just a lot of logistical effort that goes on to get in there and i just turned around and came out the next day and uh that was the second time in and I just waited, and I, I thought to myself, I need to be on the landscape with the elk minus human beings. Like, because it just makes it so much harder to hunt when people are stirring them up, you know, as we all know. And that's what I did, and I waited. And when I went back in there late, it was insane. It was crazy good. And I shot a beautiful bull, you know, and it came together, and... But a lot of that was because I was already in there early and I had learned it in that first week, like what trails and the sign and where the particular water was and how they were feeding in there. And, and I wasn't treading hard in there. I just made one nice loop through there to kind of learn it on that side. And then I got out of there. So fast forward a month later, I got to apply that knowledge in the heat of a moment, run and gun situation and put it together and you know that was i didn't spin my wheels i guess whereas when i was younger 
I probably would have spun my wheels because I spent all that effort to get in there. Well, when you spin your wheels, you're allowing for the fishers to start breaking your mind, you know, and because it's tough to endure when things are mm -hmm. negative, you know, like too many people, no elk are talking, you're bumping elk because they're quiet and you're walking right into them or you're watching people go above a little herd elk at daylight and there's people below and those elk are just dead quiet and it's prime time and all those things are just like just don't be mad just just get out just leave mm -hmm. you know and then let things settle back down and yeah nature's they're very <laughs> they're so in tune i don't think we give them enough credit for how smart they really are and i don't know that's certainly not a a, a reasoning thing that's instinct of an animal that's that's vibing it mm -hmm. it just knows and that's what we should try to strive to be is we should have that instinct and we should just know but we're predators you know as hunters their their job is they just got to eat and breed and not get killed you know and that sounds easy enough but you know we live in a landscape where we've got lots of predators and uh so we're just one more predator on the landscape and we're trying to hunt that same elk and I just find that you take the human element out of it and then if the wolf pack's not in there at that time and, you know, the grizz are more worried about foraging and just getting ready for the winter and the elk just vibe it. They calm down and they just do their thing and that ups my odds and, it, and, and in my head, my head space is cleaner. Mm -hmm. I feel more confident, you know, very focused. Whereas, you know, in the alternative, I, as soon as I am fragmented in my thinking, I feel like I need to, I just need to leave or I need to get back to base and, you know, give myself another reset. And, but that's hard to do because a lot of people don't have the flexibility of time, you know, they got to take certain time off. And so. God, that's really intuitive. You'd like really have got to know yourself and your tendencies and what works and what doesn't. And that's the uh, only way that I've been effective. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way I've been a good amazing. hunter. Like what, what great patience and maturity that that shows, like going in there and, and the hunting pressure is in there and just being able to just put it off and go, no, I'm going to come back. I'm going to hunt elk when elk are just being elk, you know, when they're not tuned in. It's to hard all enough hunters. hunting elk when they're just elk. Now you <laughs> hunt elk that are being pressured by people. Yeah. Very, very difficult, yeah. you know, I mean, and I can't imagine, again, I'm not a great mule deer hunter. I've shot plenty of mule deer, but there, that quarry to me is like, like you said, if you can find them, that's, that's a biggest part of the battle, finding that big mature buck. But you think I could even find them? I mean, so you get people on the landscape around that great big one singular deer that's living at 9,000 feet. You know, because a lot of the elk are up there, too, at a certain time of the year. and Those deer can just vanish. And they're living right there the whole time, mm -hmm. at least from what I've gathered. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? And it's just, that's just crazy to me, you know. But it's kind of like a great big bull elk, you know. Those suckers are 750 pounds in our western mountains here, and they just vanish. Mm -hmm. And they're big, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, how do they, you know, like, where do they go? And then all of a sudden, there he is. He's back first of October or whatever and it's because the people were gone he just disappeared and just rode it out chewed his cud it's hard to do even for a big old bull during the rut yeah. but, but if you think about it the cows are also spooked so they're not cycling properly you know they're on edge um, when they're on edge they're not hormonally cycling you know like there's all these things mm -hmm. going on that the human intervention created so that's where I've just learned to just try to get out of that and so we're always looking you know where we live out of you know bozeman here it seems to be the new you know ultra athlete hunting capital of the world so every stinking ridge and every part of southwest montana on opening morning of bow season's got a tent on it and these elk still have to live and survive in light of all this effort and good hunters and lots of glass in and they still do it mm -hmm. and they make us look foolish you know absolutely and it's just cool to me to think you know with all this technology and all this glass and all this information overload of how to and why and what and the mentorships and 
those elk are still a step ahead of us or the deer or whatever we're hunting they're always ahead of us you know, like it doesn't matter how good we're getting in my opinion they're they're fluidly growing with us mm -hmm. as hunters and that's cool that's a that's if we were masterful and just hunting wouldn't be fun no it wouldn't. it's know? fun because it's so difficult mm -hmm. because it feels like mission impossible a lot totally. of times because their instincts are so keen that it is so difficult that we fail a bunch and then when mm -hmm. it comes together you know it does feel like you've climbed everest or oh. accomplished something because it is so tough and it is you know it is magic when it comes together it almost feels like it's meant to be absolutely and um yeah getting that right you're uh, you know talking about being in the right headspace uh, uh being positive um you know always looking at the positive and like what's your next move and theorizing and not letting that stuff get you down and i think that's what really separates the uh the the really proficient good bow hunters mm -hmm. from from the other guys is you know it's uh, you know i talk about failure but a lot of times it can be failure on a hunt mm -hmm. and i'll just pick myself up and i'll keep going if i miss or i mess up a stock um i you know i i try to learn from it i try to analyze and go okay what did i did do wrong or what could have i done better but i don't beat myself up over mm -hmm. it and the most powerful thing about failure is redemption like oh, yeah. when you can redeem yeah. yourself and maybe it won't happen on this hunt maybe it won't happen this year maybe i'll have to come back when i draw the tagging in two three years totally. and i'll use that knowledge and i'll regroup and i'll be better than before mm -hmm. but nothing feels better than a story of redemption whether that's a a myth or a failed tag to be able to go back and to be able to solve that puzzle and come out on top mm -hmm. like that's the ultimate totally for me. even yeah, if it I takes it. even if it takes years and a lot of yeah. times you know that's what it really is it's years you know mm -hmm. like i don't i arrowed my first six point bull elk i was like my mid-20s and remember i grew up here my uncle who i followed around the woods is a heck of a bow hunter you know i i grew up with I arrowed plenty of raghorns and five points. And then eventually I was like, all right, I've killed enough with the bow time to pass time to try to kill a six point, you know? And then after that, it's like, I can do this. And back to this, you know, mental toughness thing. That's not just how tough you are in the cold and the pain and the backpacking and you know, the it's, it's everything. It's the mental toughness of the situation, but it's also the, the keeping itself, your you know positive thinking brings positive results that's mental toughness that's hard to do it's really hard to do when you're on a 12 hunt 12 day backpack sheep hunt you know you're middle of flipping nowhere you haven't seen a legal ramp you got a bow and arrow in your hand i'm talking about clients that i've <laughs> followed around <laughs> and like we're just like but i always and, and one of my be very close friends and clients um jim hens he's a slaying machine he's probably one of the most i mean as far as when it's bow comes back and shoots things dead but you got to get it in front of you you got to find that quarry and get it in front of you and there's been times where we're just hunting and hunting and hunting and it's like it's very easy to go into the gutter because you're hunting so hard and you want it so bad and you're feeling it and you're cold and you're wet and it's like we will never kill if we don't put our headspace into a positive and how do you do that it can be as easy as finding a nice rock where the sun is just beaming on it. And it's like, let's just take a nap and, and let's make some coffee. Let's just relax. Let's tell some jokes. Let's reset. You go over the ridge and there's the ramp. I mean, it's so wild how if you can just stay positive, keep yourself out there. And so I've kind of talked on two sides where I love the learning about myself through the, the hunt solo adventure of it. And I think it's extremely important to push yourself as an individual and be able to learn about yourself doing so. But back to the, you're only as strong as your weakest link when you're in a situation where it's say it'd be me, Jim, a packer and the guide. So there's four of us or whatever. It's at least I take it upon myself and I'm usually hunting with very good hunters. You know, we have to keep it positive in light of all the negative in light because there's a lot of negativity when you're out there in the elements and the weather's flipping switches and wind swirls and game blows and you're in giant country and you got to pack up and do you you find yourself you just aren't successful when you let yourself slide 
You mm-hmm. just aren't. And that's hard. That's a mental that's a mental game. And that takes a lot of maturity and and time. You mm-hmm. know, if that's you're exactly. if you're a young hunter that's that has that, then you're very wise beyond your years. I think, you know, because I've gotten to hunt with excellent young hunters and that's where I see a fail point. Mm-hmm. They're so used to getting it done like just just like that and they're great they fail or something doesn't go the way that they wanted it and i see it starting to slide and and that's where you got to be like nope nope you gotta regroup you gotta get a head change you know get your focus off of that negative and go make you know make something positive positive thinking brings positive results love that you know and i think there's some true scientific psychology behind that you know if you just kind of understand successful athletes or people i mean that's how they are successful mm-hmm. they they know how to keep their head mentally strong you know in light of even the pain and the sweat and the blood sweat and tears but it's where you your head lives and how solid it can be and how focused it can be without really flooring it you know just let it let it roll you know and again we're always learning you know what everything i'm saying might not apply to to your style or how you hunt or how successful you think you are and that's just fine that's the beauty of what we do you know Mm -hmm. it's like all hunters can come at it from a different angle whether you're a meat hunter or trophy hunter or you don't hunt predators or you just hunt predators or you don't want to use hounds or you don't it's all hunting you know i don't really fault you for one approach or another it's just i've just found through my failures and my hunting endeavors that that's just kind of models that i always live by Mm -hmm. and i try to kind of keep it in line with that approach and thinking but i don't restrict myself from going off you know, into a new realm that I've never really dabbled in before, you know. <laughs> I love that. So, yeah. and, I, and that's the unknown of hunting too, right? Like, yeah. I've gotten to hunt, I don't know, close to 40 sheep hunts, and I've guided 20, 25 mountain goat hunts, and I've caught six, 700 cats, and I, you know, so there's a lot of, like, value there A lot that, that's in very extreme situations, and um, I can say a lot of those situations have similarities, things that I now can just... I don't have to overthink anything or I just naturally know kind of what I'm getting into, like my subconscious. But then there's so many things in each experience that I'm trying to find that I haven't seen before. And that keeps it real for me, you know, like certain behavior aspects of some of these critters and some of them are individual, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. I've never seen it before and I've never seen it again. Mm -hmm. They are individuals, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they are. And it's all about their surroundings, you know, like, I mean, it depends on how they grew up and what's been trying to hunt them or, you know, what the, what the elements are and, you know, like mountain goats are, I'm, I love hunting goats. I guide quite a few and you talk about a tough animal. I mean, just the fact of where they live and they really don't come down in the winter and they're these big shaggy white gorillas and just where they live and how they do it and what they eat and you're just like my gosh i'm up there for a day in nasty weather and i just can't wait to get down to the trees you know (laughs) um so those are those things that i'm like i think i have it tough Mm -hmm. you know like when i'm goat hunting i think i have it tough look at these guys like you always got to keep some sort of perspective i Mm -hmm. think You know, and if you can do that, that's how you keep your head in a positive space, uh, which takes practice. I mean, it's hard to just say this stuff, you know. It is. Or or it's easy to say it. It's It's easy to to say it. It's hard to do it. Yeah, man. Oh, man. It's hard to live by it when you're in those difficult situations. Sometimes it can be tough to pull yourself out of. And you, the same way with mental toughness is you have to fail at that, too. You have Mm -hmm. to go home early or give up too easy sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you go home and go, 
and think, gosh, I could have done better. I could have been better there. I could have gone harder those last couple days. And I think I could have made something happen, Mm -hmm. you know? And so you think back to that. So the next time you get in that situation and you're faced with that decision, you go, no, I'm going to keep my head in the game. I'm going to keep pushing here and see what I can Mm -hmm. do. I'm going to push to this next campsite and see if I can't turn up one and get a stock, you know, because I've seen it come together on the last hour, the last day. Well, how many times has that happened for us as, as hunters? I can think of so many just epic hunts like crazy hunts comes down to the final witching hour and we pulled it together and i'm talking crazy stuff like like one time our backpack grizzly hunting out of uniquely alaska and it was a it was a it was a 14 day hunt all i know is we were there 16 days but it was supposed to be 14 day hunt and we hunted our guts out and we were on one boar earlier that was with the sow and we the stock got blown and the bear blew out and this is real rolling big country so you're you're really moving and glassing and it's not you know it's inland from the coast probably 35 miles or something but anyways we get stuck in the tent on the 14th day and we can't get out i mean the hunt's over and we're like instead of laying here and waiting let's go hunting do you think we didn't arrow a boar grizzly at 40 yards in the final witching hour of that hunt we did that's crazy it would it would have never happened if the plane could have got in you know (laughs) but we were like well let's just make the best of this situation let's hunt Uh you know and 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 i could tell you story after story that just came down to the absolute final hour and it's like i think a lot of that has to do with the mental toughness reward aspect you know if you stick your head in there and you just keep staying positive and you keep believing you're rewarded. It just, it just happens. It comes out the back end. And how many people have we known, you know, over the years that they come out, you know, they strike out or they come out of this 10 day hunt and they, and I wasn't standing there with them, but I, a lot of times I wonder where your headspace went on day six, like, or whatever. Cause we've all been there. I've mm-hmm. been right with clients and I've watched them completely unravel mm-hmm. and the hunt is over even though we're still hiking for the next three, four days, it's, it's over, you know, nothing seems to be going our way. You know, everything's going South. Like we're spooking stuff. Can't seem to find the water. We can't, it's like, I just believe in it. I believe in the mind being such a huge aspect of, of these types of hunts, you know, the harder hunts, like the backpack style, the archery, you know, so a lot of it is mental practice, I think, through failure again, you know, and teaching yourself like that's not getting me anywhere thinking like mm-hmm. that. I'm just I'm not winning that way, mm-hmm. you know, and back to like these professional athletes that are just superior, you know, they find that back to this like flow state thing. That's a positive mental approach that's superior to it's, it has nothing to do with anything around them. It's them executing at the highest level with the highest intensity of focus. And they're just doing it like it's easy, natural. And that takes discipline and years of learning that about yourself, I think. And I think bow hunting and hunting in general, that's just, there's just no difference. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Except we're in the wild and they're on a basketball court or tennis court or, you know. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Man, so true. Um, Man, Tyler, you have such great insight, like such a great data set of like being on all these tough hunts, going on all these um, uh, extreme, going to these extreme places and targeting these species, not only your own personal experiences, but being able to go with these these good quality hunters and being able to watch it fail too, is Mm -hmm. to watch it unravel and go bad and learn from that, man. It's... um, it's it's been uh this is i couldn't have drawn up a better podcast than to just hit record and like have this in-depth yeah. conversation with you like a like about every being able to touch mm-hmm. on hounds and your love and passion for sure. it, what you've learned and then uh how we've been able to tie a lot of it to these bow hunting adventures man it's mm-hmm. been amazing for me i think a lot of it too is this um and just so people in the audience know i've gotten to live out my dream as a hunter since I've been a kid you know I'm I won't give away my age I'm approaching 50 let will put it that way 
but being able to go on all these different adventures with all these great hunters from all walks of life in all parts of North America, from sheep in Alaska and Canada all the way down into Baja, Mexico, and the big muleys and desert muleys, and I mean just all the different hunting that I've gotten to do, and with all the different hunters, and realizing fairly early on, because I've hunted since I've been a kid, that there's so much more to it than just pulling the gun up and squeezing the trigger or drawing the bow and sending the arrow and so I've gotten to be an observer because I'm an artist and I've been, I'm a filmmaker and a photographer and I'm you know I've guided and you know I'm a houndsman and so all these experiences and I can I literally make a living at it 100% and I have for decades I can package that and and be able to touch it and look at it and feel it and learn from it and then I've been able to extrapolate my philosophies and conclusions that we've been talking about here and, and I just feel that I'm very very lucky to be able to do that you know that doesn't just come out of thin air I'm not I didn't I'm not a genius so I don't that's just from a lot of experience and then being very intuitive to like well how did that happen why did that happen and you know how does one relate to another and I might not know that, but five years later, I figure it out. And that doesn't come from just that pursuit of just that quarry. I might figure it out chasing something completely different in a different part of the country. And I'm like, wait a minute. So that's the growth and the mm -hmm. epiphany. It's not just my own personal hunting experiences and endeavors. It's being able to go and learn from a lot of other people and, and, be an observer, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, qu asking questions is very important, but I think, I think absorbing data mm -hmm. naturally as you watch it unfold and listening is probably for me been one of the biggest attributes for becoming a proficient hunter, you know, mm -hmm. so. That makes sense. Well, and I think, um, too, you know, you touched on it, but it is, um, it is loving the process of it. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't be a good bow hunter if I didn't love every aspect of it. If I didn't love working at it and training for it and thinking mm -hmm. about it, like I have such a passion for it. And I think it's like, it, it's not falling in love with the result or the, the end of arrowing a critter. It's like falling in love with the journey, like the mm -hmm. whole process, the learning, because the killing is such a small part of it. And even as good a bow hunter as you can become, that's still a very small part very of bow small. hunting, you yeah. know? And if you don't love it with every fiber of your being, or if you don't love it for the right reasons and the time you get to spend a field and learning and being mm -hmm. part of this wild place, like you're never going to see the success. You can't just chase mm -hmm. the success. You can't just chase a, a picture. You can't just chase sitting no. behind an animal you've got to love every part of it and the more i do it the more i love the journey you That's know right. it's well i think learning um, a lot of people unfortunately get lost and they're trying to keep up with the joneses or they're trying to kill something as bigger bigger than this guy or kill more than that or the tw you know i'm not taking anything away from the accolades of a grand slam or the 29 or the you know those are goals you know and that's great but i think more importantly if people understand that if you live within self like stay very centered on who you are as an individual hunter and learn from yourself through your experiences you're going to glean and gain so much more out of the hunt like you said the kill is just a tiny piece you know of the whole spectrum of hunting like for me hunting is a lifestyle like i do it for a living but i do it as a passion as well and i found a, a way to balance the two and I've never not had this just driving passion. And I'm a I'm a very max and relaxed personality. So like right now I hunt cats four or five days a week. And I've done that for 20, well, more than 20 years. And that's just what I do. And I it just, it gets in me. And I, and it's hard to just physically just keep going and go, but I do. And pretty quick here, I'll be shed hunting four or five days a week. Maybe not four or five because you just wear out with packing all the weight, hopefully. <laughs> but then, you know, the cycles of the seasons put you into, and then I go bow hunt and I just immerse in it. And then, and all those journeys and the cyclical cycle of it. And then over a course of a lifetime or, you know, to date, my current lifetime, I just got so much more to learn 
but I think if I, um, I've learned it a while ago now, I, I knew who I was in my heart and I knew how to stay. I feel centered on who I am as an individual. I'm confident in that, but I don't want to ever come off as like arrogant or cocky. I'm always trying to be very like conscientious of self-aware and, you know, I got more to learn and, but that just comes with these hunting experiences that you and I are keep bouncing back and forth. It's like, you got to hunt for the right reasons in order to grow, to be a master, you know, like, and I don't think you'll ever master hunting. I mean, people that call themselves a master hunter are, you should just hang it up because we just, you'll never master it. There's always something to learn. And so, yeah, the big takeaway for me that I figured out a number of years ago, and I wish a more did this because I think we wouldn't have near the contention and you know, there's jealousy and there's competition and competition's good but people need to look in and learn about themselves through these experiences and and um, grow because for me it's helped me and my family you know it's helped me in business um, friendships and marriage and all these things like the more you know about yourself and again in my case I, I'm a passionate hunter I can stay centered on what is the most important thing and how I can better myself. And, you know, the journey of hunting is teaches us that, I think, or at least me, because that's what I like to focus on. So, me too. Yeah, yeah. man. Um, so fun. Thanks again yeah, for you coming over, running down to NS. Can't Not tell problem. you how much I appreciate it, how much I enjoyed the conversation, yeah, too. Yeah, well, we'll have to get you out to a cat tree here soon. Yeah, definitely. dabble on that. Oh, man. Um, yes, I would love to. I need to experience yeah. that. And yeah, and that's that's what it really is, too, Brian, is killing cats, you know, and us houndsmen, it's all part of the management. Um, you know, we need to do it. We're the we're the we're probably the most key component of managing a cat as a houndsman, you know. But that's really not what it is. Like, it's the cycle of finding the track, following the track, using these dogs that you've molded into this well-oiled machine in this pack, pursuing this cat of an unknown travel route that you have no clue where it's going to go, how far it's going to go, what kind of tree it trees in, if it ledges out, how hard the hike is to get there. And then you look at this animal that most people never get to see in their entire life. And then just that it's like a needle in the vein to me. Like it's literally like a drug. I just can't get enough of it. And it fascinates me and I just do it over and over and over. And I just, I love that process of it. So, you know, on one hand, I just want to re emphasize like just to go and experience it is the number. Like I don't even take people to kill cats. And most people that know me, you could be my best, you could be my brother. And unless you've been working at it, you book a hunt and pay an outfitter, you know, or you have the ranch and it's your land, your ranch, and you've invited me. Those are about the only three ways that I'll let you shoot one with me because I have so much respect for the cat. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side is I also understand how important it is to manage the predator. So it's this kind of unique balance. I mean, you can, I'm sure you can understand kind of surface level of what I'm getting at but just to get you out there and look at one in a tree and you just start to be able to digest it you know from being a very successful hunter that's been in the woods and seen a handful I'm sure of cats in the mm -hmm. wild to look at them that close and look in their eyeballs and look at their paws and just kind of realize like wow that's a fascinating creature right there you know well, and we'd learn from these experiences. And so those experiences mm -hmm. would teach me lessons that I haven't learned yet, like being able to follow their tracks. And I love, I think what hooks me or what want, what makes me want to go experience it is that adventure aspect of it, where you cut the dogs loose and you don't know what you're in for mm -hmm. for the day, how far you're going, what you're going to, but you just know you're in for it and you're in for an adventure and it's during the winter, you know, mm -hmm. into these cold months. So, um, Man, yeah, it's surface level, uh, like you, you definitely, I love the way you talk about it. And, um, yeah, I, I definitely want to go experience it and go see it. Yeah. Man, it sounds Make amazing. Make it happen. Okay. It's not that we hard. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate you. you. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Brian.
All right. What a great episode with uh, Tyler. Man, I really appreciate him coming down, coming to the new studio, recording in, in person, and then just sharing so much good information that has helped make him successful over the years. So uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. And uh, thanks again for his time. I also want to thank my sponsors for today's show. I want to thank Zamberlin Boots. Uh, again, I love those Saluth, man. Those things are um, uh, the best tennis shoe, the best hunting shoe I have ever owned. And uh, I got uh, both my really good hunting buddies, Dan and Dylan, are both using those things. So, yeah, make sure to go check them out. They're building a heck of a boot, heck of a shoe at, over there at Zamberlin. Um, also, make sure to check out Sig Sauer Optics. Again, I love those image stabilizing binos, uh, best rangefinders in the market. Everything you need for optics. Um, just a great company producing great optics. And um, thanks again for their support. I also want to thank Black Ovis, Internet Retail Shop, absolutely everything you need there. And Camo Fire, a great app to save a pile of money. So uh, thanks to all those sponsors. Thanks to Eastman's. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, our promo codes, uh, if you're interested in that Mule Deer course, furthering your learning curve, we have a deal going for a limited amount of time where you put in the promo code Brian and uh, Brian MDC, and that'll save you 10% on your order. We also have a promo code for Tag Hub, uh, put in Brian, and uh, that'll get you a free subscription to Mountain Tough Fitness for the next month as well. So, um, thanks you guys for the support of those two items and all the support, uh, Eastman's bow hunting journal, Eastman's hunting journal, check out the internet TV show. You just search Eastman's hunting TV on YouTube. Uh, I have a handful of episodes on there and, uh, more coming out as we speak. And I'll try to keep you guys updated on when the new episodes are launching. So you guys can go check those out. You know, they just played one. It was a black bear hunt that uh, Todd and Brandon went and did a spot and stock black bear hunt with their bow and arrows. Um, pretty cool stuff. So you can check out that episode. And man, with that, um, yeah, just getting really excited for this upcoming trip of mine. I leave in less than two weeks. So just trying to handle all the business I can handle and uh, get everything taken care of and going to cut these legs loose for a couple weeks and um, go bow hunt like a madman. So excited to see a couple of my good buddies and just go on this super adventure. So along with that, just applying for tags. Uh, getting in my running, got my um, that new phase four all set up and absolutely shooting. So uh, life is good over here, just um, taking care of things and um, getting ready for a big adventure. So um, yeah, I'll have to load up some podcasts for you guys. I got some recorded, so make sure to get some good episodes while I'm gone and then also record some while I'm gone to um, kind of capture the trip and um, capture hanging out with my buddies down there. So just super excited. So can't wait. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have with that, guys. Um, thanks as always for the support. Social media and the podcast means the world to me. And, um, check in with you next week.